thank you all for coming to tonight's event, Building an Arc, a conversation with pioneering artist Laurie Anderson on innovation and storytelling, which I think might also be titled A, a Conversation with Artist, Performer, Musician, Writer, Director, Media Creator, and Technology Innovator, or as she likes to describe herself, Storyteller Laurie Anderson. We're delighted to have Laurie here with us at Cornell as part of the College of Arts and Sciences Arts Unplugged series, which invites the public to explore research and creative work from scholars, artists, and faculty across a broad variety of disciplines and backgrounds, highlights the role of the humanities and the arts at our university and in our lives, and celebrates, among other things, the impact and inspiration we draw from creative and performing artists and their works of art. This evening's conversation is also part of a wide-ranging series of events being hosted across Cornell as part of our Freedom of Expression theme year, The Indispensable Condition. The theme year challenges the Cornell community to engage deeply with the history and importance of free expression and free speech and to develop the skills and understanding necessary to take part in civil discourse on critical and controversial issues. We'd like to thank our partners tonight, the College of Arts and Sciences, the Departments of Music and Performing and Media Arts, the Milstein Program in Technology and Humanity, and the program's director, Austin Bunn, as well as well as E. Cornell for supporting the simulcast in the Film Forum and the recording of the event. Tonight, Lori Anderson will be in conversation with Judith Pereno. Professor Pereno's scholarly work spans medieval song to rock and roll music and concerns the intersections, contradictions, and ambiguities of subject formation, social identity, and musical expression. She's the author of two books, Listening to the Sirens, Musical Technologies of Queer Identity from Homer to Hedwig, and Giving Voice to Love, Song and Self-Expression from the Troubadours to Guillaume de Machaut. Her publications on rock music and constructions of gender and sexuality include articles on Blondie, David Bowie, PJ Harvey, Mick Jagger, and the emergence of synthetic pop music. And Professor Pereno is connected to Lori through her longtime collaborator, partner, and husband, Lou Reed. Judith's dissection and explication of a tape of previously unknown songs by Lou Reed, created for Andy Warhol in 1975, has be, been detailed in her article, I'll Be Your Mixtape, Lou Reed, Andy Warhol, and the Queer Intimacies of Cassettes. Laurie Anderson's work spans the worlds of art, theater, experimental music, and technology. Her recording career was launched by the fascinating song and music video, Oh Superman, in 1981, and her work has included live shows ranging from simple spoken word experiences to expansive multimedia stage performances. Her recent work includes a solo exhibition at the Smithsonian's Hirshhorn Museum in Washington titled The Weather, 2021 to 2022, which showcased her storytelling process through her work in video, performance, installation, painting, and other media. Lori has received numerous awards and honorary doctorates, including the Guggenheim Fellowship, Dorothy and Lillian Gish Prize, and the Wolf Prize. She continues to tour her evolving performance, The Art of F Falling, and is working on an opera, Arc, commissioned by the Manchester International Festival, premiering in 2024. Lori, thank you so much for joining us at Cornell for this terrific event. Judith, over to you for what I know will be a fascinating evening. Thank you very much.
Welcome. To- Hi, Judith. Hello. Hello. Hello, hello, hello. hello, everyone. Welcome to Cornell. Thanks. It's a pleasure to have you here. And I uh, want to just give us the lay of the land. We're going to create a conversational arc through some of your earlier work to some of your more recent exhibitions and hopefully hear a little bit of the AI work and, and the new opera. But as we just heard, your, your, your work is wide ranging and certainly one of the most inspirational aspects of your work for me has been the way you freely range through art, visual arts, music, film, video, technology, gesture, dance, stage, work. And so I want to open up just asking you about who inspired you to adventure through the art forms in this way, to break outside the boxes of traditional art forms. Oh, gee. Um, (laughs) I I am so grateful to the many, 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 many teachers that I've had. Um, But uh, just when you were saying that, I I was just thinking... um, as a kid, I, I had just a wonderful uh, painting teacher, and this is like when we were six years old. She would, she. And what impressed me most, I think, about her was she would. Uh, our lives were ruled by bells. You know, a bell would ring, class would start, another bell would ring, we'd leave. Um, she uh, came in not according to the bells. You know, the bells would ring and then she'd show up a few minutes later or half an hour later. And, Hello, let's paint tomatoes. And we're like, uh. And then she'd, <laughs> the other thing, she wore giant hats and she was just, let's make a luscious red. And I was like, oh. um. And then the biggest impression was she left before the bell rang. <laughs> and I was like, I want to be that person who's free. i free, you know. And, and And then, but many, many teachers and, uh, another. I'm just thinking of painting teachers now because that was one of the things I was doing a lot of as, as a kid. And uh, one was um, uh, a painting teacher who said, I want to uh, tell you, give you a tip, which is like when you're really stuck, try to do your worst work. You know, make something so stupid and obvious and uh, ridiculous and just give it, a, give it a try. And I think you'll find that it could become your best work because um, uh, you're, you're, uh, you don't have all those rules. You suspend them. And, or at the very least, you'll learn uh, what your rules are about making good things or bad things. So anyway, um, I'm, I'm sure we'll come back to some other teachers and their, their things that they've told me, but uh, uh, I, I'm really um, very grateful to um, people who say, you know, it's, it doesn't matter so much, you know. You, the important thing is to, to feel uh, free. You don't have to really prove things, you know. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. so um, once, that's, once that's gone, it's, it's a lot better. Mm. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you if you want, um, had any reflections on a friend of yours, Gordon Matta Clark, who is a Cornell alum from yeah. the Art and Ar- Architecture School, and he was in the scene in the early '70s with you. Is that right? Yeah. All the parties were at Gordon's, <laughs> and um, he was yeah, he was an architecture student here. Um, but he he um, was one of the things that I did with Gordon was go down into the sewers of New York um, because he had a boat and you you could and he knew how to unscrew the sewer caps and we would just climb down the ladders and go through the sewers on this boat and he also owned a lot of property in New York he bought up he had like a 150 deeds for you know those little scrappy patches of of land between the sidewalk and the and the road he uh, street he would he would buy them all up and so we would go and see his properties, you know, and just you know, hang out on on the little strip. And um, I, but mostly, I, I think he was um, uh, he was a very very social person. And he, uh, we had a group called An Architecture, uh, which was um, part of this um, group that was a mixture of. Of artists, there was uh, Phil Glass, Trisha Brown, um, Gordon, um, Susie Harris, 
Tina Gerard, Keith Sonier. There was a kind of, and the thing that that bound us together was really that we were all uh, doing things that in between the cracks of things. So officially musicians, officially dancers, but we were all, I remember one year when we were all making operas, we decided we would call it an opera. You know, it's just a thing, you know, but we, <laughs> um, so you'd see somebody go, how's your opera? Great, how's yours, you know? <laughs> just <laughs> all doing that. I mean, it was just something to call a big ambitious work and we didn't really care about what it was officially called sculpture or painting or video or something that was that was very immaterial gordon was really uh, very good at that uh, not uh, not shoving having to shove yourself into a category great well we have an image on screen this is one of your early pieces uh, of sculpture you were a sculpture mfa at columbia university kicked out three times <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's sort of truthfully because the the, the uh, head head of the sculpture sculpture department really felt that things should be welded. They needed to be <laughs> super heavy, and it, so I, I just wanted to work with paper and paper mache and stuff like that. And so um, this is a, a drawing, paper drawing that I I uh, the only thing I could afford was old newspapers, and so I would, there was a newspaper stand in the corner. So this is a. Um, the same page of the China Times and the New York Times, the China Times is cut in thin vertical strips and the New York Times thin horizontal and they're woven together so you get this kind of uh, cross, crossword puzzle of, of language. So um, many of the, the things that I was doing at that time also had to do with stories and how they, how they get told in paper or in, in crosswords somehow. Yeah, I think one of the things that fascinates me about this piece also pertains to one of the things I want to think about next, which is the, the sort of ghostly images with the with the weave. You get you can almost see faces and, and images that that are just composites yeah. from from the weave. Yeah, and it it puts me in, in mind a little bit of some of the work you you've done with um, the violin, and that's what I'd like to talk about next. This is okay. you know, one of your most iconic innovations has been what you might call hacking the violin, mm -hmm. you know, changing it around and making it talk or walk in yeah. certain ways. And uh, there we have a, a nice image from, um, I think that's from the, the new exhibit in, the, in Sweden, has a nice image of, of the violin with the, the tape uh, bow head. Yeah. Um, that's tape a, head. I think from Holland in 1976, yeah. something like that. Yeah. Can, can I play a little bit? Oh, can sure. I play a little segment of this. Oh yeah, that was a, that was a tough one because, you know, this uh, what this instrument is is a, uh, uh, as an engineer and as a recording my own stuff, I would be playing the violin, which was my main instrument, and then recording it on a reel to reel tape recorder. So, uh, I I got into this thing of like rocking the tape to find the right spot to where uh, I last recorded, and then going back to playing the violin, and then rocking the tape, and I was this is the same motion. <laughs> mm -hmm. Maybe combine those. So I made a violin that had a playback head from a perfectly good Revox tape machine, and put that on the bridge, and then a strip of re pre recorded audio tape on the bow. So you have a little, so um, this, uh, so I worked with a lot of audio palindromes, which are not predictable like God or dog, you know, you can, so the, this I'm playing some Dutch proverbs, which I found worked the same way backwards as forward. I mean, Dutch sounds backwards to me in the first place, so it didn't really sound <laughs> that different to me, but um, the in English, there was uh, uh, several songs that worked in bo both directions. So in, mean, say what you mean and mean what you say was one song that I wrote for that, because say is yes, no is one, mean is name, so you can go say yes, say yes, no one, no one, no one. And um, it, it, it also just gives this um, language-based uh, rhythmic way to make music. So I did um, have a, an orchestra play with these, uh, mm. this in these instruments, and um, uh, also in the 70s. And that was really tough because, you know, when you ask musicians who have practiced 
Um, I know you were a, a, a pianist, and you, you know when you when you I practice a lot, yeah, yeah you don't want to have someone come in with a gimmick and just go, "What? I, I'm not going to put that on my violin," you know? Let's <laughs> clamp it on. No, I mean, uh, I said, okay, "I know, I know, I, I know," but just just try it because you know, for violinists, you're you're you're. Some of us think, you know, the the chops are in the left hand, like, and the and the expression is in the right hand. So you just can kind of make it sound like very really soft or just, you know. So I said, you know, it's the right hand that has that stuff, and just try it because it's not as easy as you. So I had some horn players try it, and they just couldn't do it at all. And I said to some string players, you try it, and they could immediately do it. So they're, you know, I mean, you want to have practiced for something, you know, <laughs> and not just be, you know, playing somebody's silly toy. So, uh, but it was the the sound of, um, you know, 60 of these instruments together was really great. You know, it just sounded like so beautifully chaotic and, like you know, it's tape orchestra of, of people. A, ch a chatter box of, of where, was it all vocal? No, no, not at all. There was, there was um, a lot of uh, things that, um, a lot of low end things. There was trumpets, so you, <laughs> you know, it's a very beautiful um, way of, of, and then you can loop. I mean, I, I really love making loops, and I always have. So it's quite easy to, to do that as well on, on this instrument. So mm -hmm. um, that was, um, yeah, the tape called the tapo violin. Mm -hmm. And you've you've invent, reinvented the violin in many other ways. That's one of the, the the long relationships that you've had with this instrument. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think the first one I made. I don't know if you have a picture of that, but it was it was a self playing violin. And so there's a speaker inside, and then you play duets with it live. So you um, and then the problem is um, uh, structure of the piece. So if if there's a loop. Going on, just endless cassette loop is what it was. Um, what's the structure? How does it begin? What's the middle? Is is it going anywhere? Is there an end, or is it just looping endlessly? So, I needed a, a, a time. I needed a, a tempo. I mean, not a tempo really. I needed a, an overall time structure. So, that was a uh, something I, I did, which was. Um, uh, I wore these ice skates with their blades frozen into blocks of ice and so played this loop until the ice melted I lost my balance and that was it <laughs> the end of the concert um, I did this in in Italy uh, as well as New York and um, playing on the street and there was a guy, a guy who would show up at all of these shows I didn't announce them at all it was just a, a, through a, a gallery in, in Genoa and um he, uh, and I would, um, he he just kind of became the the MC for these shows, <laughs> and uh, I I made this dedication in pretty clumsy Italian, although I had studied it for many years. I loved Italian, and, just, and but the, I was saying in Italian that I was playing this music because I had uh, and wearing these skates because on the day my grandmother died, I went out onto a frozen lake and saw all of these ducks who were honking, flapping their wings, and, ah, you know, and, they, and they, I got quite close, and they, and they didn't fly away. I thought, what, why not? And then I saw that their feet had been frozen into the new layer of ice, and anyway, uh, they couldn't move. So um, every time I did it, one of these shows, and newcomers came to the, to, to the concert, this guy, the MC, would say, she's playing these songs because once she and her grandmother were frozen together in a lake. <laughs> and I thought, close enough, you know? I was like, why do you do anything, you know? Why do you make music? Why do you do these things, you know? And that's always been a very big part of my own uh, work is, is trying to find a why, you know? And, uh, and, and of course, how. But to understand where that's coming from. Yeah. So uh, in the ways that you've turned the violin into a, a, a speaking object or, or hacking it in various ways to, to, to change its instrumentality, you've also innovated the body in particular ways to create the instrument uh, out of the body. And I'm wondering if you can talk about that as well. And I have 
um, one slide here oh. of yeah. um, um, turning. Yeah, there's one um, image of, of that. But but first to say that I, for me, the violin is a, is a kind of surrogate. It, it's a, like a ventriloquist dummy sort of character, you know, that you can make. Uh, talk uh, and it's it's lonely to be a solo performer so you know you have this little way to have a conversation with this mm. other thing in this case this is a something that i made many years ago um and uh i built it in the basement of the museum of modern art and they gave me a commission to make a musical instrument so i i didn't know what to make so i i was one day typing on an electric typewriter and um I just looked at what I was writing, was so stupid. I was just, you know, put my head in my hands. I was just, ah, oh, this is so, and then I heard the, you know, the, the motor of the typewriter coming up through my elbows and through my arms and into my ears. And I was like, okay, I'm going to build a singing table. <laughs> so <laughs> I built this and it, it works, um, it, it worked very well. It's, it's in, actually was in the show at the Hirshhorn recently as an old piece, but uh, it was, um, and, and also I, I kind of liked the way you hear this, this piece of music is the original sort of physical gesture of despair, you know, just, <laughs> and also intimacy. I mean, if you put your hands over your ears and talk to yourself, you'll get this feeling of, how this kind of sounds, this really weird muffled sort of you talking to yourself um, and, and hearing it the way no one else can hear. So anyway, this, um, I, I worked on this with uh, music, but also finally got uh, language to work. And it was, I think I used a 17th century English metaphysical love poet, George Herbert, I think was, wrote a beautiful uh, poem about music. And one of the lines in it was, now I and you without a body move. And he's talking about how music comes into your body. And so you hear it in, in extreme stereo. So you hear in one ear, now I in you without a body. And then move, I would slowly pan it between the, the ears. So you have a very spatial experience of sound. And I, and I liked that uh, a lot, along with the fact that it was, you, you needed um, your body to to really feel that and not just hear it but to feel it which is what I like about VR too because you know when you oh, I mean I love movies but when you go to the movies and if it's a really good movie you know uh, you kind of wake up at the end of the movie and you're like oh, oh you've been in another world where's my coat where's my bag and so, and, and um, you've been kind of paralyzed, you know? I mean, of course, your mind is always working and your your memory, uh, all sorts of ways that you engage f uh, with the film. But in VR, you need your body. You need it, you kind of, it's back there, it's over there. You, you use your arms and hands. And I find, I think that that is a, a, a really big future of cinema is, is going to be um, interactive, large, uh, kinds of uh, theatrical uses of, of imagery. I mean, there's some terrible ones now, like you can walk into a Van Gogh painting, you know, these kind of, you know, sort of <laughs> nothing against that. I mean, it can be well done. It can be, you know, I haven't seen it well done, but it is, could be probably well done sometime <laughs> by someone. I am not, I, I, I hope it will be. It could be one of you who makes that. I hope so, because uh, yes. it's a wonderful way to experience. Uh, it's more like how we are with peripheral vision and all sorts of ways that we're, we're not just stuck looking at a rectangle as, as we are now with our computers as well. We're kind of going backwards in terms of physicality. Yeah. I wanted to ask about uh, yet another innovation, uh, and that is the voice. You've used a lot of vocal filters, and they certainly shape how we hear the stories you're telling. And I, and the most famous one, I guess you used to call the voice of authority, and then you gave it a, a character name at some point, is that right? Well, I, I he, Lou gave the character okay. a name, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he decided to, well, it, it's, do you have a? Yeah, a, a, a little, little clip. How that sounds, yeah. I think. Yeah. Um, it's just a. I'm an old mathematician, but I'd like to talk about just a couple of numbers that have really been bothering me 
Lincoln. Okay, so to me that that character sounds like my father, but <laughs> and all my brothers. Um, but uh, I, I invented it as a kind of just fun way to m make fun of uh, blowhards, you know, and and people who are like this technology is like this, you know. So, so and then eventually it, uh, this guy became kind of a lot sweeter and. Uh, and more lost, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and that's when he got the name Fenway Bergamot for some reason. I mean, I, <laughs> I think it's, you know, uh, um, ridiculous to call, uh, you know, voices characters. But in that case, um, it was really fun to design a voice that was uh, full of um, regret and, and a lot of uh, strange imagery. It was a way to make jump cut uh, uh, language uh, work, so it was it was um, for me a, a really also that that voice was very much based on William Burroughs because mm. I I toured with William Burroughs uh, for a while and and got a, a lot out of being around him and he was the person who taught me second person um, because uh, he would uh, when he would read his things or or many of his works had the word you in them. And he didn't mean this in an abstract way. He meant you, you, who I'm talking to, you. You know who you are, you know, this kind of you. And it was breathtaking to me to kind of go, okay, um, I over here, I'm talking to you over there. And it was, it wasn't, it, it became a whole different way of using um, language. And, mm -hmm. and it was like, Almost like the you know vu and tu and uh, uh, formal and informal uh, forms of address and and a way to be instantly very intimate and re because I for most part I I think if I'm talking to you let's say I'm talking to the you uh, part of you that never speaks and uh, who is there and is is always kind of analyzing things and you know there but but doesn't really speak and I so I'm very aware of that in, in that character too this this song that you also have up is a oh Superman has a lot of you in it a lot it's it's filled with you it has no I in it uh, it, it is a form of address it's a prayer actually it comes from a, a Massenet it's based to, inspired by a Massenet uh, we're called au souverain uh, au souverain au juge au père it's a a, a prayer um to uh, to not just to power, but also to, for to justice, and so it it goes through a number of ideas about that. But um, I think you have a second of, of yeah, because I, I was interested in drag. <laughs> yeah, the the fact that the harmonizer, the splitting of your voice into that's the vocoder in this a, case. Vocoder, yeah. okay, yeah, yeah, uh, becomes a kind of Greek chorus, yeah. and and then also sort of becomes reduced down to a very metallic sound. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think this clip, I, I believe, has both of those. But, um, yeah, I would just like to hear you think about it. Oh, Superman. Oh, John. I'm so interested in watching you do, oh judge. I want to see you do mom and dad now. Hi. I'm not home right now. <laughs> That's so beautiful. <laughs> Let's just stop that for a second. Because I do use American Sign Language later in this uh, thing oh, yeah. and, uh, to uh, use the... Um, uh, um, U.S. Postal slogan. Yeah. So, as far, in my memory, it goes. Um, so neither uh, snow, white rain, nor rain, nor gloom of night. Oh yeah, <laughs> shall stay these careers, careers. I think from the swift completion of their appointed rounds. Okay, so, <laughs> we're speaking a different. Uh, <laughs> we're speaking a different dialect. Of, uh, America has so many dialects. So <laughs> this is, was my understanding of what American Sign Language was. But I, I do love um, speaking with hands. It's just uh, there's also a number of pieces that uh, I made of 
from mudra, which are these Indian gestures that mean things, boat and jail, and I did a number of sculptures that are the physical, uh, let's say, uh, negative space of those those gestures. So um, it's, and I think it's probably just also from being a musician when you just, you want to use your hands. So, you know, for those of you who play music or paint or something, you know, it's really hard when you're just suddenly sitting on your hands just computing all day. You know, that you are, you are really like cutting off a huge amount of what you can do with, uh, with tactile things and, and uh, ways to, um, you know, uh, touch the world in different ways. The haptic. I mean, I wish there was a haptic art form. And I guess that there, uh, I was <clears throat> briefly a, um, a, I worked at um, Paul Allen's Interval Research, and they were doing a lot of things with haptics and trying to think, like, how could, how could touch become an art form? And they were making some stuff like, oh, your, your hands would skid across something. It was really very, very emotional, you know, suddenly like, or, or the, you, they would get stuck in something. And, you, and so th there, it became a vocabulary that was not possible to really, you know, make it uh, uh, in a way that was, was, was probably ultimately saleable. <laughs> this was the ultimate criterion, but you couldn't sell, a, you know, feelings like that. So anyway... One thing I've wondered about when, because you have these voices that, that I imagine over the years have gotten into your head, that when you go to compose stories, write stories, are you hearing them in different voices or, or is that a later orchestration of the stories? Uh, you know, I, it, it, I'm very conscious about that and particularly in the, in the thing that I'm doing right now and this is this, a kind of complicated um, story about uh, the end of the world. Uh, it's called Ark, and it's a um, story about a 21st century Ark that's being made because, and, and it's a story about um, where do you think you're going and when and what are you going to take? What are you going to save? You know, what are we, what, what are we going, what are we going to do? So um, it's, uh, in telling that story, it's a very, um, interesting experiment for me and really, really challenging to find out how to voice it. Mm. Because like you say, a Greek chorus is, is very, very handy. Also, sometimes there's a device of somebody who knows it all standing by, uh, who's a narrator, let's say, who kind of knows the whole thing and, and that's a handy thing. Or else you have to kind of intuit it from conversations that people are having. Mm. In this case, that... Um, story is jump-started by something I, uh, that you picked up on. A, in, uh, uh, in 1980, I did a long eight-hour work called United States, which I did because, um, and this was a, with stories and films and music and, you know, sort of a theatrical thing. And um, I did it because I was an expat, and uh, people were always saying, how could you live in a place like the United... This was sort of Reagan times, and it was like, they were like, how could you live there? And... Uh, and I'm kind of defensive about that. As, a, as an American in Europe, I was like, and they were like, you're, you're all so, like, you're so racist. And I was like, well, well you know, um, I mean, I had to accept some of that, but I also, you know, it, it's, it's one thing to say, talk, talk to some uh, Dutch person who's never seen anyone who doesn't have blonde hair and blue eyes, you know, and, and so when they decided to ask their Moluccan colonists to come back home it was a different story you know i mean we're we are we are uh in in the still in the middle of an, an amazing experiment and so anyway uh, my answer to that um uh of, of what it means to mix a whole lot of people what it means to be a whole country that's more or less a port of some kind you know so um my answer to that was was eight took eight hours to to say, and that song um, Superman was part of that, but it began with a with a um, a kind of a puzzle, and it was that and it had to do with the arc and so this is what i 'm picking up on many decades later is another arc story so to tell you briefly how that started 
that story was that there was a certain American religious sect that was looking at conditions of the world during the flood, and they realized that in order for the ark to have ended up on Mount Ararat, it couldn't have started out close. It would have started out several thousand miles to the west due to the winds, tides, and currents at the time. That's their calculations. Making the Garden of Eden basically upstate New York. <laughs> so then they kind of went, well, through a series of rather specious time-space calculations, they concluded the ark has not left yet. So I thought, okay, that's the story I want to write, the one where time gets, um, starts going backwards and starts doing all sorts of things. And uh, I, I love stories like that. So this is, but how to tell that story, which is um, also inspired by, one of the scenes in it is inspired by uh, the first scene in uh, Satanic Verses, Salman Rushdie's book, in which there's an air, airplane explosion over London and these two characters as they fall from the plane they have a very very long conversation and I was, loved that image and in this um, there's a, a, a kind of information um, I, I can't tell you exactly what happens uh, but um, an information uh, uh, disaster let's say and everything is out of sequence so um, the the uh, Opera takes place at a minute to midnight on the nuclear clock, but you know how those minutes go. Sometimes it's like four minutes, sometimes it <laughs> it's kind of going back and forth. It never settles onto, you know, a time. So, um, and also, uh, so God and Buddha have a, a long discussion about what time is. Uh, so God, in this case, Yahweh, um, is played by... Um, the artist Ai Weiwei, so he's Yahweh Wei. So he's, <laughs> Yahweh Wei is a kind of tyrannical uh, Western uh, god who, who has a, a very different idea about what time is to, to that of, of the Buddha. So, um, the, the, it, and it's really an opportunity for me to look at the two types of times that I've have been dragging me this way and that way uh, in terms of my own uh, work with Buddhist ideas and, uh, and time that's, I don't know, the, whatever we call it, vertical time, eternal now, you know, just the, 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 the concept that we have only this moment, nothing else, always. So um, it, it's, but putting these ideas and, and situations into uh, a, a work of art, uh, those of you who write know exactly what I'm talking about. How do you tell that story? Who's who's talking to who in this story? So it's um, it's it's challenging me in ways that I that I, I really enjoy trying to figure out because it's just such a head scratcher. But um, what is this one? Okay, well, that's just the oh yeah, <laughs> cover. <laughs> that's the cover of United United that States. record. Yeah, this might be the the time to uh, switch over to your laptop and uh, you have some new uh, yeah, museum exhibitions like I'm, to think I'm, through. Let me, let me, I can... If I... Uh, it seems like it's still plugged in, so I'm just going to see if we can hang on one second. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I'm going to give you a very quick... Um, uh, Bit of a crazy tour of uh, a show that, that I just did that was um, <clears throat> closed in, in Sweden a couple of weeks ago, and it was going. It's called uh, "Looking into a Mirror Sideways," and um, it, it this is this cavalcade of images is probably not going to make any sense to you because it's not really in order. But it was, the show was going to be called um, "Ingending," and it was because of. Uh, as a uh, when I first saw Bergman movies when I was I don't know in high school or something, there was one word that was always bracketed in these movies, and by silence. So there'd be a silence. Then you'd see a character. They'd turn their head three quarters, say this word, and then there'd be another silence. I was like, what is that word that is always being bracketed? Ing and thing. It means nothing or nothingness. And so I worked. For a long time, with a a, a Bergman expert in uh, Sweden about this this concept, and it appears in 568 times in his in his work. So he was always circling around this, and this was a, 
this was one room where uh, I just started making these kind of drawings, and and it's um, and they were uh, let's see, let's see if we can get this to move. There we go. Um, they, they were it was a huge room, and it was just floor to ceiling drawings of um, uh, this idea of so you come around this corner and then you go into this. Room. Oh, here. Okay, so we're going to also look at a number of other things because. Uh, okay, uh, so that was almost a cartoon room. I also did that at the Hirshhorn as well, and that mm -hmm. that room is still there. So if you happen to be in D.C., it's still in the in the uh, in the museum. They're keeping this enormous room. That, so uh, we also did um, some sets from Ark, and this is a, a um, and I'm going to kind of breeze through these quickly, but uh, uh, this is. Um, the um, opera has is based on clouds in many ways. There's a mushroom cloud. There's the uh, the eye cloud. There's the um, the cloud of 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 thoughts. And uh, those of you who have done any meditation know that that this is a a very standard way to to imagine your mind. That your mind is a blue sky, and you know, or clear sky, let's say. And your thoughts are clouds. And so you see the cloud coming, you know, you let it go. You don't get involved with it. You, here comes another cloud, you let it go. This like that. And so I was doing that in a, and I've been doing these long meditations since 1977. So I was, was doing this exercise, uh, a few months ago. And, um, for, I've been doing it for about 16 hours. So, Letting those thoughts go. Here, there they go. And so I sort of came up out of the surface, uh, up to the surface of this mindscape, let's say, and um, uh, I couldn't remember my name. <laughs> now I don't know if this has ever happened. This it went on for about fifteen seconds, which is a very long time not to know your name. Because at first you're going, "Oh, I can't remember my name. That's interesting," and then next you kind of go. I can't, really can't remember my name. And the next is like, do I have a piece of paper with my name on it? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> and then I saw next image, let's say mental image, I saw it was a huge, very shabby banner. Um, and I was in the middle of this, this kind of huge landscape of like discarded thoughts. So it was just all of this stuff. And there was this shabby banner and it had my name on it in capital letters. And I was like, this is so stupid. What does that have to do with this landscape of discarded thought? Nothing. And then the next image, let's say mental image, was a in the same gigantic landscape of artworks of all kinds, all kinds of um, uh, materials and colors and uh, points of view and different, you know, all thing, all wildly different. Um, and then another banner that says primitivism. I was like, why do you have to have a word that sum, doesn't sum that up? That is too complicated. To, I mean, so, so I have a deep suspicion of language, but, you know, but because I love it, I, I just love, it just gets in my dreams too. Now also, but back to motivation, I, I have a, also a Swiss meditation teacher. Now he does not say the mind is a clear sky. He's, he's basically, um, because he's Swiss, the mind is like, like a little Swiss lake. You know? <laughs> You're know, you like, okay. And your thoughts are sailboats. Here's, here comes one, you let it go. Here comes another, you let it go over there. Here comes another. But he went another step, which I really appreciated. He said, now imagine, what kind of wind blows those boats? Is it a fierce winter wind? Or is it just a soft summer breeze. Where do your thoughts come from and how do they appear and what do you do with them? So anyway, clouds are uh, a big uh, thing in this opera and they, they come and go. Uh, I guess the mushroom cloud is, the, is it kind of a, a clock as well. Many of these things are. And in this case, it was the mushroom cloud that became the clock that, that kind of a time bomb really that set off the Anthropocene era in in this opera. So, and I think in many other people's considerations, it might. Oh, what is this? Oh, these are drawings of a um, to explain a the childhood of one of the. This is too complicated. Okay, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, here's here's one of those dummies. He's playing the 16th size Suzuki, which is hopped up to make like really, really loud, obnoxious sounds. Um, this is a, a, a f we, I projected uh, onto uh, one, of, one of these films onto a, um, I love ripped up newspaper and, and uh, so it makes a really beautiful surface. So there was a long sidewalk of this. Um, uh, I'm going to just go through some of the, here's that, here's something called drum dance, which was um, in, I think you had a picture of that as well at one point. So I, I, it's, a, it's the body as a drum. So you, I, I was working with a broken drum machine and I was trying to repair it and I opened it up and it was like, all of the sensors are on really long wires. I thought, why are they on such long wires? And so I thought, I could build that into a suit. So I put the bass drum <laughs> on the heart, you know, and snare drum on the knee, and, you know, cymbals in the hands, and, and you play the body like a suit, uh, of, uh, like, a, like a drum set. So uh, that show had that in that as well. There's uh, just a lot of, I've made lots and lots of books, and that's uh, just some stuff. Um, uh, this is that was the detail of this um, story, which we're going to see another picture of in a minute. And um, there were talking pillows. This was a uh, uh, a story inside a pillow. So I tried to ma make um, many of these works uh, somewhat very physical, so that you really had to stand a certain way or do do something. Um, and and also this. This work, oh, this is a piece called I'll Be Your Mirror. And this is on the left, a, a picture of this person called Fenway, who is my sort of, let's say, alter ego. And on the right is, is my husband, Lou Reed, who also, ha I found a picture of him with a mustache. And so they're having this I'll Be Your Mirror um, moment, which is, uh, and I'm going to show you that in a little bit, which is a, an AI program that I've been working with that um, has put, Everything that I've ever said or written or uh, um, uh, recorded uh, into uh, algorithms, and it um, uh, they did this in, in, in part of a um, project called the Machine Learning Institute in Adelaide in Australia. And I'm going to backtrack for a second and tell the story of how that happened, and then then go into Alvi or America because we're, we're going to do a little experiment with this. I think a little bit later to see. So show you how this works. This project started with a uh, when I was an artist in residence at the Machine Learning Institute in South Australia, and right before the uh, pandemic. And so they said, "Okay, this is the biggest supercomputer in the world. What would you like it to do?" And I was like, "It's a supercomputer. Can't it invent its own stuff? Does it need me to tell it what to do? I mean, why? You know." So. Um, Anyway, I, I said, let's teach this supercomputer to read the Bible. Because everyone's always going, the Bible says, the Bible says. I say, so what does the Bible say? So there's so many translations and ways to, you know. So um, what they did was uh, put everything, as I said, that I've ever muttered or recorded or written or said in interviews or whatever, and they put it into this um, supercomputer and they crossed it with the Bible. And they sent me a 9,000-page text, the Bible according to me. <laughs> this was terrifying. Because, you know, you can recognize, and so, so do other people, your style. I mean, even though it's like, even though you're trying to disguise it in some other way, but, you know, you have a style. And uh, so I'm telling you with great confidence about the creation of the world, you know. <laughs> Uh, dominion of man over animals and fiery end in, in revelations and it, it's freakish you know so then what the next thing they did was um, uh, and, and actually that's largely the way this opera is being uh, constructed is that my version of the Bible according to that so then they also put all of Lou Reed's um, uh, lyrics and interviews and everything into this hopper, and so now uh, we write together. Now, I, I'm not um, I'm not under the illusion that I'm writing with or talking to my dead husband. I'm really not crazy, but it is. People have styles, and they have, and you can do interesting things with mixing. So, I'll be your mirror was was an experiment with writing in songwriting 
in these two voices uh, through AI that were, um, okay, let's see. Oh, here's the, uh, another view of this uh, film that was projected onto paper. And it has, all of these things have sort of rather long stories. This is, a, we also were able to build sets from the opera in this museum, mm. which generally museums don't like to pump a lot of smoke into their, <laughs> they say no, um, you know, but <laughs> this museum was just fantastic. They figured out a really amazing way to make instant clouds on the floor and pull it back in. They, they were really wonderful. And they, so this, the, a, a lot of the visuals in this opera will have, will be a mirror. It'll be like a, uh, a, the same image projected on, onto the floor. So um, let's see what else you have. I won't go into some of these things, but just give you a general view. Oh, oh here's here's a small version of the uh, the table that I built there. This one is a. I'm going to go back to that for a second. Um, you won't be able to see this too too clearly. Sorry, but I'm, I, I'll tell you that this this um, exhibition. Uh, because it was Sweden, and my uh, I had a grandfather, Axel Andersen, who always said, you know, that his story was that he came to the United States from Sweden by himself when he was eight, and he got married when he was nine, and he started a horse business when he was ten, and nobody said, no, you didn't, you know, uh, come on, we it just became family lore. You know, just these crazy family stories. And so right before the pandemic again, um, we, a family historian found out Axel's real story. And um, the, the real story was he came with his mother and brother and sister when he was five to the United States from Sweden. And um, his mother died almost as soon as he got there. And he was put in an orphanage. And then his father showed up, and he put him, when he was 10, into prison, where he was there until he was 21. This was a prison in Minnesota that had uh, electric uh, fences, guards who beat the boys, and it was for boys, and um, they worked all the time. It was jail. Um, so I had just got, so I wrote to the prison, I got the prison report, and the prison report said he was um, put in to the jail for incorrigibility. And his father's profession is listed as drunkard. So, you know, you tell the story you can tell. And in that case, um, I was just like looking at this prison report. There, there was the real story. I was doing a show that night, uh, the day I got the prison report, I brought it with me. I was doing a show at Town Hall, and we were doing it. Was, um, it was a remake of a Dylan show from 1963, and we were doing it. It was produced by Hal Wilner, and we were doing it in the exact order that Dylan had done his songs, but there were a bunch of us doing, playing the songs. Very political songs. Very, very, you know, like way out there songs. And I'm standing there with, with the producer, with Hal, and I'm listening to the song of the band that's playing out there, and they're playing uh, a song called The Walls of Red Wing. It's a song about a prison for boys, and it is the prison my grandfather was in. I'm standing there with the Walls of Red Wing prison report, and there's this Dylan song about how it feels to be a little boy in, in prison, what it feels like to be beaten, what it feels, and I was like, I'm so uh, glad to be part of a country that has a, a writer like that who has actual empathy. Because here's, a, you know, so many songs are written about like the winners and the great stuff. And, you know, he, he, Dylan wrote about losers. And, you know, we're all losers at some point or another. And uh, why not sing about it, you know? <laughs> so uh, anyway... What I, uh, so I wrote to, to Bob Dylan, and I said, you know, can we use the lyrics in your song? Because they're so beautiful. So we, this um, show was dedicated to Axel. And so one of the things, it's too bad I don't have close-ups of these. What I decided to do was make paintings of my grandfather's life as he told it, not as he lived it. So they didn't come out so well. But the ones, so we decided to do it with mid-journey, so this AI thing where you just 
put a bunch of words in. I wish I could get this like bigger because I don't think there's um, uh, okay. Maybe there's a close up later on. But anyway, um, so you put things like Swedish boy, uh, late nineteenth century, pine tree, red house, um, donkey cart, daguerreotype, and out comes you know this crazy um, image uh, and. Although there are lots of things that it kind of gets wrong, because if you say donkey cart, it makes something that's, the front half of it is donkey and the next is a cart, you know, so <laughs> it's like, you know. Anyway, um, some other violins were in this show, different kinds of, there's a tapo violin and other little instruments. This was a, a commission from Parquette magazine, which is a little uh, thing called hearing, which was a, an earring uh, with a speaker inside it that shouted. This is some more tapo things. So there were a lot of films. There was a lot of, um, this was a thing called How to Speak Swedish from that I did from the 70s about language and sweet, here's a couple of those weavings that you showed earlier. Mm -hmm. And some of these mudra, that's a word for prison, actually the, the one that's, that's oops, um, crossed. Um, there's the Bible. Uh, there's uh, photo works from the 70s and this and that. This is a piece that I did called Habeas Corpus um, in 2015. And it was a, a, too long a story to tell, really, but uh, this was uh, a, um, the story of... Um, I had done a lot of work with uh, prisoners and people who were... And, and sculpture, sort of live let's say, um, um, film sculptures. So the, these, uh, and, and this was a collaboration with Mohammed al Garani, who was the youngest detainee at Guantanamo. And um, he was, of course, not allowed to come to the United States and, and in the Park Avenue Armory. Um, I, I built a, uh, uh, well, first of all, I built a studio over in Ghana where he lives uh, for him to, to sit for several days, very motionless. And then I built in uh, New York a um, a three-dimensional portrait, let's say, of him, a sculpture, uh, and uh, it was the size of the Lincoln Memorial. And we beamed his image live into mm -hmm. the Park Avenue Armory, so he became this kind of living uh, statue. And uh, it had a number of... of I had done this the first time in 1998 in in uh, in uh, the Prado Foundation in Milan. We did something with a prisoner called Life, and it was a ways to think about originally ways to think about time how, and 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 stillness and justice and you know a lot of and and imprison, imprisonment. Um, this is part of Mohammed's life story uh, because he was. Th this show was dedicated basically not just to my grandfather Axel, but also to Mohammed, who was, as the youngest detainee, was also a boy who was imprisoned largely because of a story. These are stories in prisons, you know, young boys, because the the U.S. government, of course, as you probably know, with uh, obtained their Guantanamo uh, detainees by showing up at marketplaces in many places in the world, not many places, but a few places in the world, like, they go, okay, um, you don't have to say anything or, or do anything with your hand, but if, if you do think that there's anyone here in this mosque who might have been in Tora Bora, um, might have been, uh, could have been, um, y you don't have to be so sure, but let's say you, you think you might be, then you just kind of go like this and... Uh, um, I'll give you $5,000 cash. That's how we got 96% of the people in Guantanamo, $5,000 ahead. And um, so it was Mohammed's story versus the U.S. government's story. And the U.S. government's story was, you know, that he had, when he was eight, also, like my grandfather, when he was eight, he made his way from being a, a goat herder in Saudi Arabia, to London, joined a terrorist cell. How he got there, that's details. Um, and that he became, that he became a friend of um, uh, 
a number of terrorists who had something to do with 9-11. So anyway, it was that story versus his story. So um, they were kind of these, these twin, um, uh, twins who, who, who were the bookends of this, of this piece. Um, uh, yes, yeah, some of the uh, language of lots of my favorite writers flies through this little tiny thing on the right. It looks like a mouse is a talking goat. And um, <laughs> it's just uh, telling the story of extinct animals and listing all of them. As he, uh, here's part of the sort of scenes from the opera. So it's, oh yeah, here's a... Uh, it's very pleasant, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's words from the wise. Yeah, there's some more pictures of axles. And what this was also was um, an audio work um, because the audio, there, there were about 15 audio works that kind of ran through this, this, uh, these spaces. And they, I really liked that they leaked from one room to another, you know, so you just kind of flow through this place and it wasn't like, here's the soundtrack for this. It was just like, you were always hearing what you just heard. Oh, this is some, uh, at the entrance to a VR piece here that that is that you have here to the moon to the moon yeah and uh, it was introduced I mean the introduction is from a Yersinar story which is this Chinese painter who paints a mountain he spends like most of his life painting a very very intricate mountain and um, there's so many details of a little hut and little tiny pine trees and and pilgrims walking about sticks and he spends most of his a little peaceful seascape below. And when he finishes the painting, he walks into it. And so this was the introduction for VR, the VR piece, which is called To the Moon, which is, of course, as we were saying before, about being inside a, mm. uh, a work. There's a number of other things here that I won't go into. But um, so, for example, in this room, some of the imagery of the VR sort of spilled out into... The, the room that it was on, so so that you didn't have to immediately go from the world we live in into a VR world, that there was some sort of buffer zone, so that was a, a way that that was, was working. And I guess that's the end of that show, because <laughs> I can't do that anymore. Oh yeah, so um, I did uh, want to show you one more thing, if we have time, I'm just gonna, just gonna find that for a second and see if we, I think we, do we have a little bit more time before we do a the sure. Q&A? Yeah. Because that's yeah. the, for me, the most, in many ways, the most fun. I'm going to show you a couple of scenes from uh, what, the, what we're doing in workshops now for this ARC um, project. Which is like making, it's like made of lots and lots of screens, and it's like making, um, kind of like giant uh, paintings. And to the either side of these, this sort of big uh, screen of uh, many screened uh, things of, that play around with depth, it's coming up here in a second, um, there are little kabu kabuki sort of stages on either side so that you can see uh, the, the person who's in the big painting is off to the side in a small paint, uh, in a, on a small stage with a green screen so that you, uh, they appear in both worlds. And so it's, it's really an enormous amount of fun to make these uh, things that are kind of other worlds and they're sort of worlds of thought. This is, this is our crew working on this thing in um, building a mushroom cloud, <laughs> doing all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, so now I'm gonna show you one last thing before we go into the Q&A. Sure, um, yeah which is going to be, <laughs> I hope this works because sometimes it was broken earlier today. Um, and, but I need a, um, a volunteer to uh, come up with about a five word, so, kind of short sentence that has something kind of vivid in it, a little bit um, uh, very, quite specific. And we're going to put it into this, um, uh, a supercomputer that's, that hopefully is feeling okay. It's, it is far away in Australia, but uh, and we're going to show you how this works. First, we'll show you the last thing that was put in here. Yeah. Well, 
I just tested it with two words uh, called another day, and we're going to, it'll come up in a second, and you'll see how this works. And it came up with a, a quick version of, of uh, that, and the day is high. Sometimes it's like, you know, as you know, monkeys with typewriters, when you put <laughs> this stuff in and just generates things. And the day is high and the night is low, and I'm sitting by the window today, and someone said, hey, it's another one of those days. So it's, oh, okay, another day. Where you don't know if you're happy or not, but there's no way to, in hell that I'm going to tell you all about it because none of this matters at all. Okay, so, that, <laughs> so <laughs> this is Lou Reed on that, and... and <laughs> I'm going to just move it to to myself and see if so you get to how this works. Um, oops! Oh no! Waiting for another server. Wait a second. Oops. Okay, so I got to go back now to this and see if I'm just going to say that. Say that. Make sure that it works. It might not be. No, it's going oh. popping over to the Bible. Okay. Um, we're going. I'm going to do a little quick repair work on this while you um, <laughs> talk about something interesting. And, um, uh, the, I, I think that this thing is going to work, you know. But you know, with like with a lot of these um, programs, they come, they go. And in this one, um, when it didn't work earlier today, I got in touch with them uh, in. Uh, in Adelaide, where it was 5.30 in the morning, and they're like, what? You know, <laughs> I said, can you, can you just look at, at this thing and see why it's not working? And um, it, it does put me in mind of uh, one of the questions that I was going to ask you about um, te technological apocalypse versus technological wonder. Yeah. But uh, I think we experience technological apocalypse every, every time we have these, these moments. Let's break down. I, I think if really, things really did break, uh, um, it would be uh, a, a very serious problem. <laughs> um, yeah, for, I mean, so it, it does say s waiting for the server, so maybe I'm going to give this a little... Um, uh, I'm going to, to restart my um, thing here and see if that's the case. Okay. Um, in the meantime, maybe we could just have a question or two that we can see because we we were yeah. going to do this start this fifteen minutes ago. We're going to do the Q question and, and answer. So we've just been <laughs> blabbing away and uh, yeah, yeah. I, I see a question up front there. Yeah. Hi there. Uh, like I'm a local radio DJ and I play you on the air all the time. Um, and one of my favorite songs that I play all the time is uh, "While We Sleep," the duet you did. Oh, really? You play that? How did that come about? Like, I always kind of describe it as I'm imagining this is like your first date. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, the, it, was, it was kind of a mantra sort of song in, in my sleep where we meet, and it was we were trying to write some dream things, but we, we abandoned that pretty quickly because, you know... Um, it's horrible to have people tell you their dreams. You know, you just you know, they start talking like, "Yeah, uh, my grandfather was walking." No, wait, no, 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 no. It was my uncle Bob. No, no, it wasn't Bob. It was, you're like, please don't tell me your dreams. This is not a movie. You know that I want to see or that ever was made. So um, anyway, but but we both. Uh, uh, loved loop-like things and and phrases that unfold again and again in ways that are are interesting. So that was the genesis of of that um, song. We did a, a lot of songs together that we haven't released, and sometimes I'm going to get around to doing that because they're some pretty crazy ones. You know, they're really not. <laughs> you know, yeah. yeah. Another question uh, over there. Yeah. Hello. Oh, um, thank you so much. Uh, it's been an incredible day. I was thinking about um, the posthumous collaboration as everything you've ever said. It's also a form of like archive of language and like not everyone has that um, capacity to be recorded. Like, like the fact that you have all of that, all of those words that you're um, that Lou Reed 
uttered and also mixing that with what you said with the suspicion of language. Like I have a, you said I have a deep suspicious suspicion of language. Um, but how, I don't sense like a sense of nostalgia in this AI posthumous collaboration. <laughs> or just like when we were at the cemetery early, there was an easiness with like death. And I wonder if Buddhism has to do something with that or that sort of detachment, but also this generative process that it still has like a, a kind of essence, as you said, of like everything you've said has a, a mark or something. So like how, how does that negotiation go? between the suspicion and the collaboration? Well, it might be a little too uh, late in the evening to say this, but I, I actually don't actually think that we're here right now. <laughs> <laughs> might be a little late to say that, but <laughs> that is what I think uh, I, I and feel. I, I think that, that uh, we have a... We live in, in, in some very, very interesting mental and emotional states that, that can fool you about what time and place is and that uh, we have such powerful imaginations that we can jump out of, of that into uh, what we call other worlds, but, you know, we are already there. So um, I think... Um, it's still waiting for the server. This may take a few minutes. <laughs> I don't know what's happening with Australia, time-wise. Okay, so um, anyway, I'm going to let it keep uh, spinning its wheels here and, and just try to answer you a little bit better because um, I, I'm, I'm very interested in, in different um, mental states and, um, and emotional states and time. So uh, those are... are uh, one of the reasons that I uh, that I studied meditation and try to um, engage uh, my mind in in uh, that and also that argument about what the uh, between the God between God and the Buddha about um, how that works um, how and, and I guess for many people you know it, it, it's it, these are becoming bigger questions as we live in in times that are really pretty wild, you know, and and so many of the stories floating around about the world is ending, you know, and people are like kind of um, spinning with that one, you know, it, it doesn't look good, but is it, in fact, you know, any, of course anything could happen in this story, we could be hit with another plague that wipes out 98% of the human population, uh, hopefully leaving 2% of really smart, wonderful people who could start again and with plenty of resources and time. You know, that's absolutely, absolutely possible, you know. And um, on the other hand, you know, telling the story of, uh, that, of the end of the world is just as hard as telling the story of the, the beginning. It's, it's also shrouded in myths and legends and, and superstitions and sort of craziness and and uh, also I mean storytelling is very big in our our country now I mean it's like it seems like sometimes half the half the country doesn't think the other half of the country is even real you know this this is a <laughs> we don't need AI to be confused by AI we already think you know you're not real you don't believe what I do so so it's it's um it's a very wild moment for for storytelling so anyway I think um Telling the story of of the end of the world is is a, also uh, a, a really wild one because your stories are something that you tell to people, other people. If you're telling this story, you're telling it to no one, and a, this is an awesome storytelling challenge <laughs> to tell it to no one. I was also talking to one of my teachers who was saying. And I was saying, what happens to the big wheel of karma when, if we all just just, just leave the planet, if we're gone from the planet? Um, I mean, and, and I have to say that the first thing that that's, um, because I, it's a weird thing to say, but um, just because you were just talking about language and, and I was just thinking of all the, hey, it came back. Okay, <laughs> look at this. Okay, we're going to, I hope you have come up with your phrase now, but what I did want to say was, um, 
you know, how many trillions of years were, were all the one cell, two cell things hopping around? Uh, none of them had names. We come along, name them all. Then we leave, and then they become nameless again. Mm. And so, you know, how we define our world is, um, is our own uh, reality. This is, I think, um, going to come up in a couple of no. seconds. I'm going to, we're going to ask you, does someone have a, a five where it can be just a short phrase, it could be a question, it could be like, what the hell does this work? It could, and, and we're going to have Lou respond to that. <laughs> Who would like to write a short Lou song? Uh, I, can I? Yes. Uh, okay, there's one person there. Right, uh, in the first row. Hi. Oh, I'm, my hi. name's Coral. Hi, um, Coral. The cathedral sipped on muscle milk. The cathedral... What on muscle milk? Sipped on? Sipped Could on. be okay. suckled down. <laughs> on. Muscle milk. Okay. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Let's see how it goes. Okay. Generate. Da, 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 da. Okay. I mean... Uh, I love this stuff, but, you know, it, it is moronic most of the time. <laughs> it just allows you to do a kind of crazy jump cut if you're stuck in some kind of thing. And this is struggling with muscle milk. I, uh -huh. I sipped a glass of milk, put on some muscle, and got down on my haunches to see what I could do. It was the first time I had done anything like that, not in the past, not even in the womb. But here in this room, where I am the only one, the others have wives and families and lives and children and sex. This is what I should do, but I don't want to do anything. I want to sleep and wake the next morning laughing because this has happened before, too. There's a cathedral about five miles from here. <laughs> <laughs> Got to get that cathedral into the mix. You know? <laughs> it's nearby. So. <laughs> Anyway, songwriting is often like that. You know, you just um, write something. Uh, okay, I'm just since we're here, I'm going to see what I would make of that. <laughs> just, I do this all day. I tell you, it's like <laughs> I'm, I'm very addicted to this silliness. You know, and I do. I do recognize that it, it's you know running through stuff. But that's what I do when I'm trying to. F find something to I have a I have a real rapport with this, with this system <laughs> you know kind of like uh and I sipped my milk and looked around and all the people were sitting down and there was a cathedral in the sky and they were singing oh we're going down to the bottom of the world you don't know how we're going to make it up again there's no way tonight no way to get out of the site you got to go today it's the last day of play the last chance to get on alive and kicking one the game still has some life left in it yeah, it's a time of year again, a season when everything seems to have gone bad or better or worse than it did before. And just as I'm about to ask what's next, uh, what's next? The answer is nothing. Just as I said, don't think of it as dead. This is just a muscle memory. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you know, not bad for off the cuff, you know. Yeah, it's like, it's... It, it, it's an improv thing, you know. So improv AI. Um, <laughs> it helps I wouldn't that publish that, <laughs> but I would read it and I would go, "Nice try." <laughs> this is just a muscle memory, and now that, that would be enough for me to kind of go, "Interesting. Where where does you know uh, how does milk and memory and muscle all kind of get into the M game?" <laughs> I was going to say, it certainly helped that you were reading it out loud, both of those. <laughs> so, <laughs> Well, I have, a, a, they have cloned my voice, and it really is very convincing. <laughs> and, and that, of course, is yeah. terrifying as well, as we all know, that then you can make any puppet say anything. You can. Yeah. And so we'll all have to have our ears tuned to what's real and what's not, and it's it's kind of like, in a funny way, I, I had to do a, a concert at the new um, uh, performing arts center that just opened in New York, right next to the, the hole of uh, the 9-11 hole. And um, it, was, um, it was really eerie uh, to um, be doing it uh, there. 
And the same I was starting to tell the story, I was thinking about another thing. Um, 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 muscle memory. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I think um, that uh, it just floated out of my mind. I did not really know why I was going to go off on that uh, on that tangent, except to say that that um, uh, I I find that these attempts to make big corporate structures uh, into art scenes are are really scary, and that um, that it's. Uh, uh, it's hard to make a, a a real community, a real scene, you know, and it's and it's easy to just kind of make a big building and kind of go, okay, this is where art's going to happen. Not necessarily, you know. Mm -hmm. So it, it's it's a we're we're living in such a wild moment of um, uh, where where corporate America is just really really intense, and so. Uh, I watch uh, young artists trying to deal with that and look at it and see what that is and how to make art now and what is who's your audience and how does it work. So it's it's a uh, a very challenging thing. And as I, we were talking about lunch, I was saying um, somebody said, "Don't talk about how great it was when you were a young artist." Stop doing that. Because <laughs> I do that. You know, it was so great when we were all so free, it's so tough now. I mean, it's a great time to be an artist anytime. You know, it's just a, a, a wonderful thing to be able to try to invent things. And no matter what era you find yourself popping up in, you know, there's always a lot of stuff, really interesting stuff to do and material to make it with. So uh, it, it's, a, it's a very exciting time to be uh, doing this kind of thing. This kind of stories and work. Should we do some, one more last? I think question? maybe one last question. Or do you want to wrap up the? Well, let's let's, let's see what that question. One is. last question <laughs> okay. uh, out there in the middle. Um. Hi, I just wondered. Um, thanks for coming. And I wondered if you got a chance to go to the Dalai Lama's library while you were in Ithaca. The Lama's library. The Lama's Dalai Lama's Dalai library. Lama's library. Dalai Lama's oh, the, library. oh, I didn't Lama's hear that. Library. Yeah, right, right. No, that we Lama's haven't done. Lama's library. Look at that. <laughs> library for Lama's. I'm going to get over there right now. <laughs> so, you know, all the Lama's are there. Uh, I did not. I did not, but I, I would really like to see what's in there. His archives, all his books, wow. you know, stuff like that. It wow. just opened last week. Yeah. You should see it. Yeah, I would love to see it. There's a lot of things. I got to go down, diving down into some, uh, well, the library where we saw the all that. Rare and manuscript collection. Yeah. 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 Really, uh, in, I mean, I really love uh, libraries and archives more than, I mean, I just really like to see old books also and... Um, and there was some beautiful Melville things that we saw, and I was just talking to the uh, curator down there, and I was saying that when I was writing a, um, an opera based on uh, Moby Dick, a friend gave me the Bible that Melville had when he wrote was writing Moby Dick as a loan. And, and so um, he had gotten this Bible at Sotheby's, and he, when he, after he bought it, he took it to the FBI because he saw that there's a lot of writing in the book. And it had been erased. His wife saw and said, you know, you're writing in the family Bible. I'm going to erase it. She erased all of his notes. You know? <laughs> so he said, oh. <laughs> and so that was sacrilegious to be doing that. So anyway, the people at the FBI said, you know, well, you know, if it had been 50 years ago, maybe we could see what it was. 150, it's too, too, too long ago. So I spent the time with a magnifying glass going through every page of Melville's Bible and found this thing in Isaiah about that crooked serpent, that piercing serpent that lives in the sea. And it was basically the whale as the snake and the ocean as his garden, you know, where he works on ideas of good and evil. And I was, it was hair-raising to see these stars around this verse. And I was like, whoa. So... You know, there, there's, there were lots of, of books down there that also had 
uh, notes in them in the margin. And so it's, it, what a, I mean, it's a national treasure down there. It's just so amazing, all the kinds of things. Also, the, uh, the, these great um, uh, connect, uh, collections of um, things about witches and, and the... Uh, and the the witch handbooks for, for mm. in the 15th century when the church said there are witches there are witches and here's how to find where they are and you're like whoa we're That's all going church crazy yeah. <laughs> <You know? It's, laughs> the church says there are witches here's a handbook to find them and you're like whoa you, know, see, you think we're crazy now those are they, they were you know <laughs> and then and, and an incredible collection of anti-slavery pamphlets and you know when you look around this country now and what, what the havoc that that has created in our national life and then you think what were we thinking well some people were very aware of that some people wrote a lot about that some people were were spent their lives uh, dealing with that and and this is an, an archive of that effort I was I was so moved to see that because you don't that's not a story that you get so often it's just like our, our failure generally like our failure to make this this country where people can get along and here are these people going no this is really wrong there's something you know and stack you know shelf and shelf after shelf after shelf after shelf about people who spoke up at that time to uh at their own peril to say these things and and they were um and, and here is the record of that. So it was something to be, that I felt so proud of to, to see that, that someone had bothered to keep all of that and, and show this other story of people who were not going to put up with that and put themselves way out there to say that. So I was just, it was a very, very, very moving experience to be in that, in that um, archive. So just very grateful that that exists, you know. Well, I think that's a wonderful note to end on, Laurie Anderson telling a story of visiting Cornell's archive <laughs> and the A.D. White collection of uh, abolitionist pamphlets. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you to the Milstein Program for helping to bring Laurie here and Arts and Sciences and Arts Unplugged series. And of course, thank you most of all to Laurie Anderson for her generous spirit and stories. And thank you for, for inviting me because, you know, you came to our attention. At, we have our little archive that we worked on for many, many years, and you wrote an amazing, amazing work that was, we just read and went, who wrote this? <laughs> <laughs> we just found you and went, okay, we, we got to go there and see who wrote that. So thank you very much for, thank for you your so scholarship. Much.